Philip, did you hear the Jill's okay. question? Yeah. <laughs> How long can, How long can uh, yeah, how can I stay good when it's in the uh, uh, recording? Oh, yes. okay. 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 That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. We yes, have yes, those buckets from Oli oh, yeah. in our uh, storage or the yeah. furnace room. Yeah, I have some grease that I have in the process. Yeah. Okay. It's been hard for me to take that out in process. I don't think we got to get it done. She's connected. This is the her. Hi, Amber, can you hear us okay? Yes. Yeah, sometimes yeah, there's different forms. There's this like tobacco, it's like modern form okay. sometimes is what's necessary for the words and stuff. There's also some that comes from red hosier uh, dogwood. Mm -hmm. The main base is red hosier dogwood and then uh, bearberry. But then we have to add other plants to it too. And we'll we'll actually be talking a little bit about that just because it's like there's a connection. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming and being here. We're really excited about this event. Um, this is our round table um, featuring five wonderful panelists from the Upper Great Lakes region um, on the revital revitalization of wild rice through a collaborative indigenous centered effort. And with that, I will let our panelists take it away. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so we're members of a collaborative between several uh, Upper Great Lakes tribes and an interdisciplinary team from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And we are working together to understand and protect wild rice, which is called Monoman in Ojibwe or Sing in Dakota. And really a motivation for this work is that since the onset of Euro-American settlement and colonization, Monoman or Tsing has been in decline due to multiple, um, but often uncertain environmental stressors. And so our research is really aiming to shed light on this while very importantly, uh, prioritizing and centering indigenous knowledge and tribal communities questions. So actually our Ojibwe partners have given our collaborative the name Kawegara which means first we must consider wild rice. And um, actually I think I'd like Joe, a tribal elder in our collaborative to start us off here. Joe, maybe you could introduce yourself and explain the cultural significance of Monoman. Sure, <clears throat> um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Joe Ravine, a uh, member of the Lekwamu Bamali Spirit um, Ojibwe, uh, also a program um, manager for our wild rice program for the tribe and um what i wanted to wanted to share just a little bit um so we, uh, we have some uh sema which is a jibwe word for tobacco and usually when we start out these these conversations or we, we started out our, our project um we had offered that that tobacco to to guide us and and you know kind of, you know that was uh, how we how we think how we believe our our values, you know, is that those those um, the words that we communicate, you know, those those manadus, those spirits will, will hear us, and, and when we're done, we can carry that carry that forward, and, and out of respect for all all of our relatives, whether they're winged ones or manomen, um, the four legged creatures, you know, it's kind of kind of the, the, the driving force for for. Um, our, our the project um, collaborative um, yeah but pass it on to you um, before that I was going to see if you wanted to talk about the importance of the moment as well and migration those kind of things or if you want me to take that oh yeah I can touch on that yeah you know I, I think the you know I don't think well see the the importance you know um of Manoman wild race um, is uh, is directly tied to to who we are, who I am as, as an Ojibwe person, Ojibwe tribe. Is is, is Manoman is, is is tied into to our, our prophecies. We're spiritually connected to it, and that is why we are. Um, it is important. It also um, the the 
spiritual connection to it. Two is um, that harvesting wild rice and working to protect wild rice <coughs> is true is because of the fact that that you know um, we want to honor not only you know our ancestors but you know, those ones that are coming behind us. Um, it's told that you know wild rice has always been you know part of who we are the Tigui people from the time we're born to the time that we that we are made to rest. That's how important when is to us. Would you pay for me coming to Quay and the Jinikas, Miss Gobby Kang and Dunjiba, Midizi and Dodem, Melanie Montano and Debo? Uh, Melanie Montano, I'm from the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe, so very top of Wisconsin. Um, and yeah, I'm actually one of the, my story is kind of complicated because I wear a few hats, but uh, one of the members of the group that works on the Newman um, as my role with Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, with them, I am the traditional ecological knowledge outreach specialist with the climate change program, but then also a new grad student uh, under the forestry department at University of Minnesota Twin Cities, um, where I'm doing mostly fire research, but also still working on Manuman, which there's a connection between the two. Um, and basically, when it comes to our world, there's connections with everything when it comes to the environment. And we were talking earlier too how there's connections even with like healthcare and those type of things. Um, but those are discussions that we can have further on. But one thing I want to mention and expand upon with Joe here is uh, with Manuman, um, and you'll hear us pronounce it differently too, Manuman, Manoman, it's kind of like tomato, tomato. <laughs> um, but with us, it really just depends on like location and, you know, that some of your, the dialect with the Ojibwe speakers and things like that, but basically it's wild race. Um, and so for us, one of the other reasons that it is extremely important for people and tied to our, our identity um, is that, during the time when we were out east, uh, you know, out east of the United States, that area, we basically started having dreams and visions and things, and we were told to follow some prophecies and uh, travel to where the food grows on water, and we were told to travel west until we found that place. And so as Ojibwe people, um, we made our journey west, and that's why you'll see a lot, a lot of our people are up in Canada and you know upper United States. And then of course there's others that live all over the world as well. But majority of our people, that's where we um, live and where our reservations and homelands are. And so eventually we made our way following that prophecy um, and different signs along the way to uh, the area of Lake Superior, um, but mostly Madeline Island, which is near Bayfield, Wisconsin, one of the islands there that um, is not technically part of the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. Um, but it's one of the, the group of islands that's there. And so that's where we were told to go. And that's where we found the food that grows on water. And there's um, wild rice that grows there on our particular reservation. There's only just a little bit of it. And a lot of that has to do with some environmental factors that have changed over the time uh, due to land development and things like that. Um, but also the nearby reservation, Odena or Bad River also has a really good population of wild rice. They say it's the best, but I don't know about that. <laughs> um, Lionel says it's the best. Um, but yeah, in our, in our region, you'll see a lot of wild rice. And for us, uh, that food is not only a part of our story of what brought us to this region, but it's again, a part of our identity. And for us, it's considered to be one of our first foods. Um, when we are put on this earth, we are given, you know, directions on how to survive, basically, and that's why we're still here today. And that's by dependent by being dependent on uh, the environment and knowing that everything that was placed on this earth um, came before us, like those four leggeds that he, he mentioned, and the flyers, and those ones. And it's our responsibility to learn everything we can about them and to take care of them. And Manuman is one of those. Um, and if we take care of them, in turn, they'll take care of us. And so with that, um, our first foods are considered to be things like uh, white-tailed deer, blueberries, strawberries, wild rice, um, rabbits, you know, all those type of different things. It's not cows and things, but um, one thing that's interesting too is 
there's a lot about horses are actually real significant to our culture too, but not considered to be first foods, but a lot of people yeah. think of those coming from- I'm still trying to figure this out. Like, however, there's- I'm like comfortable with this room. Ojibwe ponies that we're yeah. tied to. So there's a lot of um, ones in our environment right. around us that we're extremely uh, not just tied to, but also dependent on in order to survive. Um, in our particular area, we rely on the fish from Lake Superior, whitefish and um, trout, and then a lot of us do spear fishing and things, but manumen is one of those foods that's considered central to us. Um, with our ceremonies, you know, those of us that live a cultural-based lifestyle, manumen is part of all of those ceremonies. You'll always see it, and it's, you know, sometimes it's simple with a little bit of salt or pepper or just alone. Um, sometimes it's added in with a lot of other foods, like actually prepared with venison or other things, but it's always at all of our ceremonies in order to acknowledge and honor that spirit. Um, and speaking to that, we see Manumen as an actual being. It's not, you know, a thing or a resource or just a plant that's out there. Um, and that's something, you know, when I look at that picture, I think about when we see those plants out there, we think about being out there and harvesting um, and who that plant actually is and what that plant provides for us and how we're still here, we're still existing because of that plant. Um, and if we have been told that, you know, when that one goes away, that's when we'll go away as well. And so we have to do our best to take care of that one that's there. And when we look at that being, we think about everything, not just what you see in that photo, but everything from the sky world to the roots and how those roots are communicating to all the other beings around. Um, there's also uh, a rice bird that is one of the caretakers of that plant. And, you know, we when we go out there, we listen for that rice bird and things. And um, so that's one of the, I guess, some of the stuff from the tribal perspective on how Manumen is important to us. Um, and as tribes, when it comes to any sort of work being done out there, a lot of our tribes have our own natural resource, environmental departments, fisheries, and all those type of things. And we do our own work on Manumen, but then we also have Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, which works for 11 member tribes in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota. Um, so we have, you know, Manumen in Michigan, Minnesota, and uh, Wisconsin. And so they, Glyphwick works within ceded ter territory, so off reservation. And there's a lot of wild race focused work done out of there as well. Um, but part of the problem as tribal people, what we run into is that there's also others doing work out there, especially others that do research on wild race. And they tend to think about Manumen as just this resource or as a scientific um, thing to study because it seems interesting or cool or exciting or it's what the everybody's doing nowadays. Um, but for us as tribal people, we, again, are really, really tied to that. And so we struggle with organizations, entities, agencies, all those ones that tend to do work around Manumen that don't even consider us and our connection to it. And Manumen isn't, you know, our plant as Ojibwe people. Manumen is a gift that was given to all people. You know, we've brought uh, Manumen to trade over in Panama and Peru and things. And with some of the indigenous people over there and they had told us that they had dreams about this plant and that they heard about it. And this plant is only in our region though. Um, and so we really push for agencies and organizations and things to properly consult tribes, but also just sit down with us at a table like this and talk to us about who Manumen is so that they can make sure they do the best work they can, but also have us at the table every step of the way. And that's one thing um, that's core of our research that we really try to do with the university is make sure that they're sitting with us at our table and we're sitting at theirs as well. And we're exchanging, you know, thoughts and concerns and love for that plant and understanding how to take care of it uh, together. Um, and so that's something Bazil will be touching on a little bit is some of the ethics behind the collaborative work that we do with tribes and tribal people. Um, and part of this had started because there were really, really big uh, unsettling concerns with University of Minnesota doing some genetic research on Manumen. And for us, genetics is a real tough issue. You know, some of our people get genetic testing done to figure out why they have medical mysteries and things like that. But 
it majority of our people, it was real hard to see Manuman being looked at genetically and having the spirit of that not being taken care of and not respected and being damaged in the process um, while our people had no part and no say in that and the information was being misused. So there's a lot of negative history to that. And so part of why this uh, effort with our group of researchers had come out was to try to fix some of those things, to try to do the good research and to do it in a good way and to sit together um, in doing so. So I'll kind of leave some of my stuff at that and pass it on to Mary or Desiree. Or back to Crystal if you want. Thank, thank you, Melanie and Joe for explaining that. Um, so hi, my name is Crystal Ng, and I'm a hydrologist and an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities uh, in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And I'm able to talk about how this collaborative got started and really just how it has completely transformed the way I think about science and my role and my obligations within it. So I would say like, like many um, on the university side of this project, I am a you know, conventionally trained settler scientist. And by that, I mean that I've always learned that academic experts know best and that all of our research is just gonna somehow benefit society someday. But um, you know, when I started working with tribal partners, um, a lot of them were pointing out a lot of my early missteps um, really just scientists, um, just, you know, really harmful actions, as Melanie was just alluding to, and really helped me realize that I am part of institutions that have been established through violent dispossession of Native lands. And when we as researchers uh, conduct our earth sciences work uh, without accounting for Indigenous peoples, without engaging with Indigenous peoples, we are perpetuating the harms inflicted on them. And I would really say in addition to you know, partners like Joe, Melanie, and Cecile, uh, we've also been so fortunate to have indigenous uh, principal investigators and indigenous students on the project. So, um, you know, they really are um, walking with a foot in, in, in two different worlds, you know, that conventional academic world, but also the indigenous world. And, you know, unfortunately today, uh, none of the indigenous uh, principal investigators could join uh, for this event today, but I can tell you that they have been playing an essential role in helping all of us uh, really learn that all of our work has to support tribal sovereignty and put tribal perspectives first. And, um, and so actually with our tribal partners, we've been establishing uh, protocols for ethical research, um, you know, to hold us all accountable to make sure that our tribal partners are included in all of our decision making and that we gain prior approval from tribes for all of our activities and publications and really ensuring that all our work benefits Monoman and tribal communities. And actually our, our protocol, our, you know, we're, we're trying to share this and hoping that it becomes more common. It's uh, in our 2021 uh, co-authored paper in environmental science and policy. And, um, you know, and I think that this research that, um, that really, you know, really has this new collaborative approach in which we as scientists, um, that we have humility and we learn from indigenous worldviews. I think that this is not just ensuring that we're doing this work in a good way with tribes, but it's also we're realizing just opening our eyes to so many just really, really new and really important um, ideas as well. And yeah, and I, I really have to say it's been this, you know, this newer generation that's really leading us and I think pushing you know, like older scientists like me and to, to, to think about these approaches in new ways. And so that's actually why I want to pass it off next to Maddie and Basil to, to talk more about, uh, about the research that they're really leading. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Crystal. Um, I'm Maddie Nyblade. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Crystal's one of my advisors. Um, I am a settler scientist. I grew up in central Pennsylvania and moved out to Minnesota to do this work. Um, I was just 
while you were talking, struck by this, the memory of actually met Crystal at AGU in 2018. And I heard her share some of this story that she just shared with you. And I was really moved by her, her humility. And she was sharing some of the mistakes and missteps that uh, our collaborator made in the beginning. And she shared it publicly at an AGU session. <laughs> and I had never heard a hydrologist in like a very formal traditional space, like admit so publicly to a mistake and admit that uh, we were, she was taking along with the whole collaborative team an approach that put relationships first and we we're going to work to build relationships with tribes and put the science on hold um, in order to develop meaningful relationships and, and develop that ethical um, protocol and, and formalize that through sign memorandums of understanding between tribal governments and the researchers. And then with that, we could, we had we started to build that foundation that allowed us to collaborate and build um, and grow science that was bringing in traditional knowledge as well as Western or academic science. Um, and that has been really exciting privilege for me to be in that space as a PhD student. Um, I've been had the privilege to go out in the boat to do field work with Joe and many other um, tribal resource staff that we work with. Nancy joined us once too. <laughs> Um, last summer, uh, and when we're out in the in the water paddling with Monomany, you know, we, we're we're talking about the history, uh, people's memories of the place, and all the different ways that the beings are interconnected. Um, and that's just such a privilege as scientists. You know, we might go study some place we've never been before, and you start asking questions. But here we get to be out on boats with people who have generations of knowledge of these places and these relationships, and that allows us to to really. Um, ask really powerful questions that are related to um, real long-term observations and knowledge that uh, Ojibwe people hold of Monomen and hopefully bring our Western science to be in support of their work to protect this really um, special and important being. Um, and so we've been out for several seasons collecting water quality data, collecting sediment, pore water data, so the chemistry of the, the water in the pores where the monoman roots are growing, um, collecting vegetation data, um, water levels, all sorts of data that we've been collecting, and then we brought it together and at the end of every year, um, come back with our tribal partners to analyze that data and sit down and say, like, what does this mean to you? We can share what it means to us, this data from a Western science perspective. What does it mean from your perspective as tribal resource managers? And that has, um, through that collaborative work, has really expanded our vision or our understanding um, of the whole complexity of monomen. Uh, and how it's this being that's interconnected to so many different things. And we can measure the chemistry and the water levels, but that's just one tiny slice of this whole system. And so we've been trying to find ways in which we can really use Western science to support answering questions um, that have come from that really interconnected thinking. We've been looking at the impacts of climate change on, on wild rice um, and land use change. And also looking at forestry um, and, and the differences between deciduous and evergreen forests and the impacts on water level that then translate to impacts on rice, as well as thanks to Joe really directing us to think more about the sediment. So we've been thinking about the sediment um, texture and the and how it's accumulating. And that's been an area we're also exploring. So happy to share more about the specifics of the research uh, through this discussion, but um, I'll hand it to Bazile to wrap us up on thinking holistically and the work that we are doing together. Sweet. Thanks, Manny. Hey, Buju. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Patil Panik. I'm uh, from the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior, Ojibwe. Um, I also work for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission as the Tribal Climate Adaptation Menu Coordinator. Um, and I came into this research about a year ago, almost a year ago now. Um, to build a conceptual framework that's uh, culturally appropriate and um, approachable by Indigenous peoples. So it's framed within a, a medicine wheel, a culturally important um, a symbol. So I, I created a conceptual framework to outline all of the areas of the research, um, and that's how I came on. Um, but I just want to mention a few things about um, this collaborative really honoring indigenous knowledge systems and, and the way that they prioritize and center that. Um, and I think it's uh, almost, um, we have the duty to do that, I think as 
Western researchers or Western sciences scientists, um, we do have a duty and responsibility to integrate Indigenous knowledge. Um, it's it's a knowledge system that's been around for thousands and thousands of years. It's been here on this land uh, way longer than Western science has. So um, we might know a thing or two about managing manumen wild rice in a sustainable way. Um, it's something that's valid. Also, we, we have our traditional stories about how long Anishinaabe people or Ojibwe people have been here or just indigenous people in general in North America. Um, we have these stories that say we've been here since the last ice age and that was only uh, discovered recently that we were here and things just keep getting older. Um, and uh, Western science keeps uh, validating our traditional stories or our traditional knowledge um, and, that, and that keeps happening. Um, what else do I have to mention? Uh, also, I think it's, it's important to note that indigenous knowledge systems and our own forms of science have a larger role in Western science than is commonly recognized. I think that's um, that's proven by uh, or just Western society in general, that's proven by thousands of place names that are um, that are from indigenous languages, Wisconsin, Minnesota, um, Chicago is actually from an Ojibwe word, um, Chigog, uh, which means skunk. So it's known as the stinky city. <laughs> yeah, stinky place, um, which is why I was called that. <laughs> uh, Minnesota, yeah, Wisconsin, thousands of other place names that are based off of indigenous languages. Also, we have a ton of inventions that um, <clears throat> have came through indigenous people's syringes, aspirin, um, canoes, kayaks, sunglasses, uh, mouthwash. Nobody was washing their teeth when they came over here. <laughs> that one is Pinky Chicago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I'm glad you get our humor. <laughs> Um, even uh, penicillin too. So th there's like so many different examples of indigenous knowledge uh, being true and fact and correct and only later being validated by Western science. We also have a large role in Western society than people recognize. Um, so that's kind of the, the first duty of Western scientists to integrate indigenous knowledge is the validity of it. The second is what we mentioned that um, Western scientists have done a lot of wrong to indigenous peoples. We mentioned the genetic research that was going on, uh, land dispossession. Um, society and scientists have done a lot of wrong to indigenous peoples, treating us as objects or taking our cultural items for research, um, not sharing research um, outcomes with us and results with us and not sharing that knowledge. Um, so that's also where that duty comes in to um, really center indigenous uh, priorities. Uh, this moving forward with uh, this collaborative. Um, so I, I graduated just recently uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Native American Studies from Northern Michigan University. Um, but I've been kind of doing a lot of work uh, for a long time in, um, in these academic spaces, even before that. Um, but this collaborative especially has, uh, for me, has been a really good example of braiding scientific knowledge and um, indigenous knowledge and bringing those two together and holding them, um, holding indigenous knowledge, especially as a valid form of knowledge. Um, this collaborative has honored that, um, and I think, centering research priorities over what the tribal partners want to see, I think is super important. And again, we'll see that, I'm sure we'll see that what uh, what Joe is thinking is probably true and correct in fact, based off of those uh, traditional stories or just his knowledge that he's gained. Um, we've also done it in a, um, made an effort to do it in a culturally appropriate way, um, especially with bringing me on in the building the framework that I'm building is culturally approachable, uh, making sure that knowledge is um, useful to indigenous communities and not just a, another paper to read. Um, also, I think 
another duty in working with tribal communities is to uh, not just uh, is to is to walk your talk. Um, one knowledge sharing event that we had at the Lac de Flambeau Reservation <clears throat> over the summer. Uh, part of that was attending a ceremony, um, and have we had it at a location that's a uh, sacred location in Flambeau, that a place that I've gone for ceremonies for since I was young. Um, so a place that I know as like a traditional ceremonial place. Um, and then all of a sudden there were these Western scientists and researchers um, that I had known from other locations being in this sacred location and something where I was more comfortable with. And this is like my space and where I'm most comfortable. I thought that was amazing to see that. Um, you could tell uh, some of the people were a little uncomfortable and uh, kind of nervous, um, but I thought that was that was amazing is that they're willing to put themselves in these uncomfortable situations or um, get outside of the four walls of academia and in a be at a ceremony and um, honor that indigenous uh, cultural practice. Um, so that was really important to me and I think research collaborative overall is has done a really good job at honoring indigenous knowledge systems and um, tribal priorities. And I think we're uh, collaborative just seems to be uh, getting better and better at that. Um, long ways to go, obviously, for all of us even, but I think that's all I have to mention. Yeah, Rich, thank you. Did you want to touch on ethical engagement a little bit more? Um, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, one problem I see with engaging with tribal communities is obviously tokenism. Um, a lot of Indigenous peoples are tokenized, uh, just used as a checkbox. Um, if you, if there's an Indigenous person on your committee and it's uh, just to say that you talk to the Indians and this is what the Indians said, um, when, when ethical engagement is, is honoring, honoring what they say, um, and, and actually integrating that. I've, I've said that um, some committees should do certain things or they're doing this wrong and, they, and they'll agree in the moment, they'll nod their heads, um, but then continue to go the complete opposite way. Um, so I think engagement is not just uh, checking off that box that you um, talk to the Indians, but actually integrating um, their priorities. And I think that's all I have to mention on that. Yeah. And I just want to say a quick uh, appreciation for letting us shift with, you know, the changing people that were going to be here and everything, because um, when life things happen, it's like, we just got to do what we can do. And we're actually super happy and honored to know that you were willing to have, you know, one of our elders at the table, who is also a race chief back home. Um, but then also one of our young people who's my son also. <laughs> so that makes me especially proud. But, um, but I just, that's, you know, part of who we are as a people to make sure we're always having our elders, you know, in the room and having their voices as well as the young ones, because it's these young ones that are going to be carrying on this work and in the future. And that's who we're doing all of this work for. Um, and with Bazile here, he's only 22 years old. And so, you know, he's already got a lot a lot of responsibility on his shoulders that he has to carry on and so it's good for him to be able to not just come and listen but also share his you know view and his lessons that he's already had in his short life so I'll say me glitch for that. Well this is intended to be a conversation so reporters please jump in the conversation and ask questions if you have questions. Yeah. Please so, introduce yeah. yourself so yeah. yeah small room and be friendly. I have a question. Uh, my name is Amy. Hello. I'm from uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, our journalism section, which is in Washington, D.C. And my question is, you know, as journalists and reporters, we often only have a very little bit of time to write about any one thing. Um, and when that involves Indigenous voices, I sometimes am not sure quite how to be respectful because it's so brief. You know, we, we probably won't really know each other. And it's my job to capture the story truthfully and accurately, but not necessarily to frame it around the messaging that any source, any person I'm talking to wants in the story, right? That's sort of opposite of our work. 
So how can we be respectful while also honoring the objectivity of what we do? That's a good question. <laughs> I have a few thoughts unless anybody else wants to take it first. I guess you know, I answer, so I'll try to answer that question. I mean, it, I guess it just depends, you know, um, on, um, on, I guess, in how you, like, say, if you're going to, if you want to do a, a future story down the road and, and you wanted to talk to me specifically, we'd probably either, you know, reach out to an email or something. And then we just kind of, for me, I would just, you know, have that conversation. And then um, I think, um, um, you know, one of those things that, that, um, would be, I guess, appropriate with, you know, as we started out with the, with the same, uh, you know, I guess it was even some uh, like a little gift or, or something and, and what specifically you wanted to, to talk about. And there's, I guess, you know, um, the, um, to go from, I guess, you know, I'll just use Nancy for, for example. I know she reached, she reached out to me and she's, and if she did a story on us this summer, and it's just it's like, I think this is kind of like a continuation. And, and it's just like sharing those, sharing those, the, the story wherever you're submitting it to, or like Washington Post or um, or Ryan or something like that. You know, that you should you share that with the with the individuals. You know, and that's that's kind of what what happens and um, has happened, I guess, in my experience in the last few years, you know, with the thing with, with Nancy here. So, yeah, it's just, uh, um, there's like if I were, there was something specific that you wanted to talk about, I didn't I didn't know I would probably have to reach out to somebody and see you know to see if you'd be willing to talk about you know that um, specific topic. Um, I guess you know some some will depending on who they are. It might be an elder. I, you know when 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 somebody older than me. You know, would was we always try to gift them, you know, um, you know with tobacco and and, and 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 a gift, you know, um, it's, uh, and you probably won't get the full story. <laughs> <laughs> and then you might not get the real story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's. I mean, there's, there's. I guess it depends on who we who, who we talk to. You know, I guess like for me, I, I mean, I'm I'm pretty pretty open, pretty flexible. Um, I don't really ask her too much other than these, you know, uh, back of my bro or, you know, or, or some bull Durham or something like that, you know. Yeah, one thing. Uh, um, Pot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I want to mention, too, that uh, I think the the news um, latches on to sometimes is like the just the poor Indian um, mentality that... Uh, all these poor Indians with boarding schools and always want to report on the more unfortunate things or, or drug use in communities. You do the, go to the um, horse reservation and show all of the starving children. Um, but I think it's important to focus on the more positive things and fo focus on those positive stories. Um, and, and that's the, I think, I think we need more coverage there than the the more negative um, parts of Indian country. Um, I think there's also uh, just uh, knowing that there's a sensitivity um, there with uh, people being um, put out there publicly. There's a lot of issues of um, domestic abuse or um, even trafficking is an issue. Um, there was, for an example, there was a video that um, I was involved with a little bit where um, a community, the video was shared and a community member came back and said that they wanted their portion out of the video and their name and stuff because of a domestic abuse issue. They didn't want their abuser to know their um, information about them. Um, so that information had to be withdrew and just that flexibility there I think mm -hmm. is important. May I also say that in some ways, what you're asking are questions that I think we face, right? In terms of there's this clash in culture because, you know, um, we're supposed to be producing publications all the time. And how does that jive with mm -hmm. 
making sure that we spend time in a canoe together with Joe, that I have a meal with Melanie. And I would also say, I think the question becomes not how do you fit their, yeah, how do you adapt their culture and what they need and want into your format, but how should we be changing our format? How can we be pushing back in our academic institutions and you know, to say that the system needs to change to be more inclusive. How can how can your journal be changing maybe so that their voices can be properly, I think, um, included? That's a good point. Yeah, yeah that's a big yeah. part of what um, I think about all the time because uh, for many years I was the environmental director for the Red Cliff uh, tribe, so. So my own tribe and, you know, some of the issues that we worked on, the media was all over it, like uh, barrels in Lake Superior in the 1950s and 60s, the Department of Defense had dumped barrels in Lake Superior filled with toxic waste, toxic waste and um, radioactive waste and things like that. And we received funding through the Department of Defense, of course, ironically, to, you know, assess it and make attempts at cleaning it up. And the media was all about it. And they weren't the most respectful, except for I will say Wisconsin Public Radio, Minnesota Public Radio, and NPR were great. They're amazing with us. But part of that was because they would show up at our doors. They would sit, you know, and have a meal with us. Um, you know, they would welcome us to their homes and things, and they created relationships. And I think that's where a lot of it lies is you have to if possible and when possible, try to get the system to change, you know, whoever you're employed by. And one way I describe it, not to be disrespectful is, but, you know, you kind of have to think about it as not just a job that you're doing. It's not just about your paycheck and paying your own bills, but you're working with a people, you're working for a people. You know, if somebody were to say, want to do a story on your grandma or your daughter or, you know, your partner or whatever, would you want them to come in and just get to know them, do the story for about a half hour, publish it, call it good, walk away, go on to the next story. But what if it's a story about that grandma, you know, who's been in a boarding school, who has been abused, who has lost her entire family, who has been, had the language beaten out of her, um, you know, but then she turns around and she's a powerhouse and she's on council and she's like making all these huge, huge decisions for her tribe. And really she's, not in her mind, you know, maybe she's a humble person, but maybe she's considered a legend like Joe, Joe here. <laughs> and, you know, how would you want that story told? Would you want that story told just through a couple hours of sitting, somebody sitting down with her? Or would you want those people to build relationships? And I think that's where the system needs to be changed. There needs to be time for actual relationship building with tribal people. And so going into the communities, not just, you know, when you're on the clock, but try to find a way to carve things out where you're going into the communities to get to know people and truly like understanding who they are and having true intentions to actually build relationships and become friends and share experiences, share stories. Um, because, you know, for us, it is about our survival. It's and it's interesting almost being under a microscope at times and people just wanting to get a story and call it good because their boss said to go do it or whatever. You know, and I get that and we're not in the, the shoes of journalists. And so it's hard for us to really fully understand that perspective at times, but for us being the ones that are talked about or written about, it's like, spend some time with us, hang out, get in the canoe, you know, fall in the water out of that canoe and like, let's be real about things and experience these things together. And I think that also helps then break down those barriers to even have better stories because then you're really getting to know who those people are because, yeah, because behind us and obviously we got, you know, we're a people of humor and that's how we survive a lot of this stuff too. We use humor to get through and we tease each other like crazy and stuff. And that's one thing when you go out, if you're getting teased, you know that it's going to be okay. That's a good thing. <laughs> so, hmm. yeah. Can I add one tiny thing? And I'm not really to jump in here, but I just in working on this story, um, I know there's some parallels with science. And um, I know these guys don't reveal the uh, rivers and lakes that they work on because that's important to the tribes. And um, I went up last summer and spent a couple days at um, Joe's 
preservation. And I know the name of the river, and I guess it might have been you when we talked recently, but I thought, oh, I guess I shouldn't reveal that. And I mean, I've been a journalist a long time, and I worked for a pretty understanding um, organization, but I took it out of the story thinking, yeah, that shouldn't be in there. But um, in some journalistic places, that probably wouldn't fly. But I'm, you know, I will insist. <laughs> Just because I think, no, well, no, but they haven't seen the story. <laughs> but I mean, it's um, it's going to run on a progressive publication, so I'm not worried about that. But I just think that's one tiny way that you can be respectful, I guess. Um, but I know that journalism has these deep roots like science that's very, you know, paternalistic is the right word, but just this very sort of, and it's evolving, hopefully, but yeah. It's just my well, you know, it's it's a constant tension. I mean, we're taught to think that our we're our, our responsibilities to our reader or to our viewer. Mm -hmm. That's who you know, we have these relationships. We have relationships with sources and whether it's scientists or people from the community or you know, the CEO, you have relationships with the source, but you have to are we're taught you can't be thinking about that you have to think about the reader your responsibility to the reader and the viewer mm -hmm. it's your job to serve them and it's mm -hmm. just not always that simple mm -hmm. uh and, and 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 i think what you can argue especially in a case like this is that actually you could better serve the reader and the viewer if you have a respectful relationship, a relationship that's deeper to find the deeper truth you're going to get, you're going to actually be both. You're going to serve the reader viewer and you're going to uh, get get the real story. I mean, that's the real story. You can't get the real story parachuting in some time. So you're not, so that would be like, hopefully that, the happy medium. That parallels our experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's just, the ways our eyes have been opened for just the science as well could not have happened without us doing this research in this way. I can give you a pretty good example. So you go to, you need this piece of rope, you know, for for um, tie it on your canoe, right? So you got brand new ropes all wrapped up, this nice, right? Well, somebody like me is going to take my time on grab, pull it out, you know. We might have a zeal come along and just you know, get all knotted up, you know. So it's kind of, Why you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like, like you know, like that, you know. It's, it's kind of way I see, kind of way I see that, you know. And then, you know, it's just, so then, then if I look at the University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, uh, the University of Minnesota is one that, yeah. you know, so, University of Wisconsin, some of my people that, that I worked with there are really, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to mention no names or anything, but you know, I, I, I do a comparison, there's a big difference. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not being disrespectful about that, but I'm just saying that there's, there's a big difference. Yeah, it goes back again to changing the system and correcting some of those norms, you know, status quo, like, Things have been done this way, I'm sure, in journalism for how many years, but it is probably time for a good change. And, you know, the way you describe it, I think is spot on because in my mind, I, you know, as a reader of certain things, I definitely connect with things I read in a more powerful way if I know that person has really done their homework. They've really spent true time with, you know, the people that they're writing about, for example, and they have the best intentions because then it's like, they're speaking on behalf of their spirits rather than just like checking this off their box or whatever. Any last comments or questions? Thank you for this lovely discussion and for coming down here to visit with us. Um, I think that's the end of the program. Anything further about that? Um, yeah, I mean, did you have anything else you wanted to? If I may just lastly just um, try to follow up with that though is I think we also need to be mindful that there's not exploitation happening because I think that 
in all the discussions about integrating knowledges, that's something we have to be really mindful of, especially when we realize we can get the better story, we can get the better science if we get their knowledge. And, um, and so I think it has to be genuine. I think actually first and foremost is how can our science, how can your story be, I mean, even though this is against the train, right? So this week as a reader, our press is supposed to be the, the science, but actually the benefit has to be first to tribal communities. And if it is just that going for the, the science, going for the knowledge, going for the story, then that's just exploitation, which has been happening for decades. And that has to stop. So kind of going back to that, actually the first is stopping the harm that has been happening. Sorry, I did want to just mention no, that. I think there's also that. Um, and Crystal also mentioned knowledge is with an S, and I think that's important too when, you know, you're doing some of this work out there with Indigenous people is to know that we're not all one voice, we don't all think one way, we don't all do um, the same thing, and it depends on reservation, Indigenous group, communities, neighborhoods, families, like there's, we're a dynamic people, obviously, and so there's a lot of differences, you know, Bazile has, even as my own son, he has different teachers than I've had growing up, so the way he knocks rice may be slightly different than the way I knock rice. And I don't agree with her a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he does things very differently. <laughs> but, you know, to keep that in mind that when you get a story with, you know, maybe even a couple of people that doesn't necessarily re represent all Indigenous people or all Ojibwe and or all one reservation or things like that, there's a lot of dynamic ways of doing things and you know our knowledges are extremely complex and obviously that's why we're still in existence today after the extreme horrible attempts at taking us out I mean serious attempts and we're still here so Brazil could you talk a little bit if you don't mind mm -hmm. um you said that you, some of the researchers went to a sacred space and they had some discomfort or they had to get over that. Mm -hmm. This one, if you could be more, a little more specific. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I could just sense. So this was in a, a ceremonial hall, like a log building okay. um, where we have our drum ceremonies where the drum comes out and we do certain songs and feasting. <laughs> um, I could just sense a general nervousness or hesitation um, to... Uh, maybe when asked to pass out tobacco mm -hmm. um, like we did today mm -hmm. or or just to be in that space um, mm -hmm. as well just a general hesitation of uh, the protocols of things mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. when to do certain things uh, <laughs> during our feast we have um, elders eat first and it's kind of like hesitant all the kids want to go first <laughs> get up there and eat right away but um you gotta hold those kids back that don't know and let the elders go mm -hmm. first. So mm -hmm. general hesitation and just kind of uh, some tenseness maybe. Yeah. I could add on too, because I think at the Wild Rice Feast this year, Joe wanted us all to get up and dance too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> never, I think very rare in science. Yeah. I don't know in the yeah. science space I've ever been at to <laughs> dance. <laughs> but was very happy to try it out, um, follow Joe's lead and the lead of uh, the community. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah. <laughs> but I think it, it's like moments like that that are so powerful points of connection where we get to be humans together and see each other. And the, to me, this project has meant so much more than a PhD because it's been a place where I get to explore and be my whole self and bring different ways of knowing that I have within myself that are not traditionally valued within the, in the academic institution, but I get to learn from these wonderful indigenous teachers that I have. Um, and, and learn more about myself too and how I can bring that all to this work and, and be a researcher that's accountable to tribes um, moving forward. And I've just been really grateful for the experience and the community. Was that a special tribal dance? One of us tried. <laughs> no, it was just, uh, just for it, fun. Was, it was just, we had um, drumming and singing going on there, round dance, we call round dance, and that's where everybody gets up and dance and in a circle, and, and so we're just gonna invite everybody to come out and 
né? Well, I remember your one of your adopted daughters handed me a plate and spoon. I yeah. said to you later, oh, she's so polite. And he said, well, they're taught to respect their elders. So I'm like, I'm an elder. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But that's, that's cool. Yeah, and that's the thing, like we're, you know, what we're taught and we're not always the best at it either, but taught to take care of our visitors and to respect them and honor them, even though, you know, there's a long history of us ourselves not being respected in our own homelands and things. Mm -hmm. So we still at least try to keep that in mind and do our best. And, you know, when you get invited to do things like dance in a ceremony or something like that, that you better do it no matter how nervous or scared you are, because like that's a huge honor. And that means like we're we're really wanting to, you know, take you in and offer you a chance to be in that space with us. So something that our people have been doing since time immemorial, you know. Yeah. Well, I gotta see about that. <laughs> <laughs> we did bring um, some stuff. Yeah. I don't know if people are interested, but we have um, our, this is rice that Joe and I, this is right back, yeah. yeah. Joe and yeah. I harvested together um, this fall um, and some rice that still has a pull on. Yeah. So that's what, uh, it looks like you you guys, you and then basket. it's a winnowing basket. Yeah, winnowing basket. We want to demonstrate. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is one of the tools we actually use when we process rice the the old school way and stuff. We use it for stirring our car keys and stuff like that too. But <laughs> <laughs> but I highly suggest you at least take a little bit out of you know one of the bags, even some with the hulls on too, and just hold that rice and think about, you know, the stories that that holds of our people, because that rice has memories, you know, that has memories of generations that's been out there hearing our own stories as we're out there with our own kids and things and the healing that that's provided. Um, when we do our traditional funerals too, we always, of course, like the other ceremonies, try to make sure we have rice there. And we, one of the practices that we do when our people are grieving, we say that they're grieving for about a year if it's your immediate family member. And we tell those people um, that are grieving to try to avoid go out there racing and things until that grieving time is up because it's not necessarily that grief is a negative, but it's so powerful that if that person goes out there on that rice bed and rices, they could pass that grief onto that rice and that rice then will become sick. And so we wait until that person actually gets fed and then they can go out there and that act of feeding is basically you offer, say it's rice, for example, or whatever's in season at that time, it might be, you know, white-tailed deer or strawberries or blueberries or whitefish. Um, you offer that food to them four different times. And on that fourth time, then they can finally take that bite. But what you're doing is saying like, are you ready? You know, are you ready to um, move on with these things? Or are you still grieving? And you basically deny it three times and then on the first time you say okay I'm ready to you know move on and start letting go of some of that stuff so how do you get the husk off <laughs> the process there's a few different there. ways you can you know there's more traditional ways and there's more modern ways of course too so but I don't know if you want to talk about as a as a big time harvester <coughs> Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, uh, you know, I've been harvesting rice probably 35, about, about 35 years. So when I, when I first started harvesting, we were called um, in, in the process and we were what we call dance the rice. Um, so that's like dancing on the rice and, you know, we have like a, make a little hole in the ground and then uh, sometimes we have, sometimes we have that canvas in there. We dance, dance on it. We usually have moccasins, um, or we have uh, we make the hole and we put a uh, like a, a wooden barrel in there with, with the canvas in there and we dance on it that way. And we frame sit, yeah, with a frame and we hold on to. Usually, want to get the latest person out of the family or you know maybe something you know Brazil, 
<laughs> Crystal and grandson, I mean, with heavyweights like me, is crushed that race so much. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and then we, uh, well, before we get to that that point, what we do is uh, usually when we harvest it, we bring it off the lake. Or my family, what we do is, is we'll, um, um, we'll um, what kind of like pre parch the rice. So it's kind of like, so a lot of times we got, we got what we call rice worms, we got spiders. You know, in there, so we kind of, we kind of, kind of what we call burn the bugs out of them, you know, and out of the race. And then at that time too, it um, it um, it it uh, stops that ripening process. So when we get green rice, and, and that's that's what our family likes green rice. You know, we try to get some really some really pretty rice, and we get mixed in with green, and then we get to ripe. We get some ripe um, kernels in there. But yeah, so it's it's and then from there, um we we we'll let it sit overnight and then uh depending on what the weather's like, if it's you know, blue skies and 90 degrees, I'll we'll set it out on the on the canvas and let it let it sun dry for for a day or two and then we we'll, we'll get into get into um, parching it, full parch. We use um, our family, some of use made with different kinds of wood, but we use you know, um, fire scorched um, red pine stumps. Um, we use that, and that's kind of a whole different flavor than probably if I had seen her you know, <laughs> sniffing that bag and see through it. A lot of times when you, when you, when you, when you, um, when you parch it, that flavor, that wood smoke has, has, has that flavor to, to, to the race. And, uh, so when you have that, that kind of like that smoke flavor to it, <clears throat> and then when you cook it, then then you want to take that, that smoked pork bacon, fry it up real crispy like that, crunchy, and put it in that. <laughs> good, it's good. I almost taste it. <laughs> but no, I mean it's, I mean it's, and it's, and that's probably one of, probably you know, that's probably like one of the reasons why. You know, there really isn't, a, you know, a lot of people doing, you know, both tribal and non-tribal like wild race harvesters because it is time consuming. But, you know, today's, even even in modern technology, the processing is way different and it's still time consuming. And it's, I mean, it takes a lot of um, energy, you know, a lot of finances to get the, you know, the, the parts and necessary equipment to build, to get the roasters and slashers. And, and it's just people don't have really the time to have somebody build one or mechanically inclined, you know, to, to build one or, you know, those types of things. So there's, there's always people looking for some individual um, well raised um, thrasher people that thrash and process race. So it's kind of a kind of a um, what's the word I want to say? Very few. There's very few that will that will um, process it, you know, for other people. But there, I mean there's 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 a handful out there, but the ones that do have their own they will you know, just because it's it's time consuming. <laughs> yeah, and even less that use the traditional methods. So when he talks about dancing on the rice, that's one of the traditional methods and one of the, you know, first steps to removing those hulls because it's when they're dancing on that rice, they they're wearing moccasins and so yeah, the lightest person so that they don't crush the the grains, but that sort of rubs those hulls off. It starts that process, but. What is also doing that is the heat, yeah, like laying it out in the sun and things. Whereas, like the modern processors have all this different equipment that does a lot of those things. Um, and like that basket again is called a winnowing basket. And you know, the when the rice is in there and the hulls are on and they're heated up and things and they've been in the sun and other stuff for a while, you can have um, you're in front of a fan or some sort of wind source and you're tossing it up. Or you know, people have different ways of doing it, but. Um, when that comes up into the air, the air actually catches it and blows those hulls off too. And some of the final stages are literally picking through grain by grain to try to get the last of them off that haven't been removed. Um, but, you know, people do a mixture of traditional and modern using processing equipment that they've built. Uh, Great Lakes and Fish and Wildlife Commission got funding for a while there to build some equipment that they actually 
lend out to uh, some tribal members who are doing processing, but part of it, like we have very few people left that harvest anymore and process anymore and even eat manuman anymore. And part of that is just like, we've gotten so far away um, from our traditional ways for various reasons for convenience um, because of, you know, the government making it illegal for us to do things for quite a while. It was illegal for us to burn for blueberries. And so we stopped eating our blueberries and, you know, we're returning to that now by using cultural fire to try to get our blueberries back. Um, they introduced commodities to us and, you know, it was easier to open up a box and make a thing of mac and cheese, which is the worst in the world for you, you know, but now we're trying to get back to eating some of those first foods again and also trying to learn about those traditional processing methods again as well. Is that part of what you're working on with your research? The, the fire, berries? yeah, cool. yeah, super focused on the fire research stuff about returning. Yeah, the end all is basically returning cultural fire to various areas where it's been the land and beings there haven't seen it for years and years and mostly from the time of the early 1920s or so when the government said that's it we're not doing fires anymore and now we have a whole nother problem on our hands so mm -hmm. yeah. and you need it for the blueberries themselves you need to have fire oh yeah blueberries and actually a sema that's one thing um our traditional tobacco so what we were handed here of course is that more commercial tobacco when we're trying to get back to using the more traditional use which wasn't commercial tobacco at all. It was a mixture of a uh, red osier dogwood and bearberry plant. And a lot of times others were put in there like blueberry leaves, strawberry leaves, um, you know, and there's sort of different mixtures. People have their own personal things, but almost every one of those plants, especially blueberries uh, are fire dependent. And what's ironic about that, and this is a whole nother tangent, but um, that with with uh, tobacco, we need tobacco even more than manumen in order to survive. That's how we function as a people. Mm -hmm. When we use that tobacco, we're asking for knowledge. We're asking to gather something out in the woods. We're asking, you know, for everything. Um, and it, it's basically a gift of our survival. And in order to use that, the actual traditional tobacco and to get those plants that are out there, we need fire. Mm -hmm. And so fire, those plants are fire dependent. And so we have to put that fire on the ground to be able to grow the plants to gather a tobacco that we make to put back on the ground before we set that fire. <laughs> so it's a reciprocal relationship that we've been forced away from by the government. And of course, logging uh, priorities and practices and things like that. So we're, we're returning to a lot of that now. Another story. Yeah. <laughs> and mine is more on like Wisconsin and Minnesota Point area, but overall return of cultural fire. There's a lot of work we did on like Stockton Island up by us too. So how are you still in place? In a lot of places, yeah. Especially places like National Park Service. Yeah. yeah. So that's we have up by us at Apostle Islands National Lakeshore has en entered into an agreement with us where um, you know, at first we were just able to go out there and gather a few berries because those were our traditional gathering lands and everything. And we, our homelands where our reservation is, and we couldn't go out there and hunt, fish, gather until we got those agreements in place. And it started by going out and gathering some balsam boughs or cedar boughs. And then eventually we actually returned fire to the land, which for National Park Service was so, so hard for them because they're like, this land was pristine, like there were no people here and this is how we found it and people floated above the land and that's why the ecosystem is the way it is. But now they're learning, oh, fire made it like that. That's why people were actually using these lands, that's why. So now through those agreements, our tribal people are finally able to start doing those kind of things. But yeah, there's a lot of rules still in place that we're trying to push through barriers, but also the trauma that Smokey the Bear has created, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to cut off this conversation, so I want to invite you all to come across the little press room. We have some snacks if you have time. <laughs> some manuman. Amazing is the first food, as none of them are first third foods, I'm sure. They're uh, cookies. <laughs> they love cookies. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, and I brought them to list oh, of yeah. other presentations or contact information for people. Yeah, and feel free to contact any one of us, you know, down the line if you want for things too. So 